Hustler, one who makes money, real short and real simple. When you respect the game, you respect all that comes with it. Extortion, bank robbery, and hustlers. But gangster is a little, little bit of all. Those that take it, take it from the ones that make it. And when it came down to making it, Fluky Stokes was that nigga, hands down, or cards up. Just depending on what side of the table you was on. I don't even know what drugs look like. I never used them or... any and everything that involved money. However, because of nationalities and ethnicities and surely racial boundaries, a black's earning potential was limited. Limited to petty crimes and drug abuse. Encouraged to be subservient with sir. Sent off to war only to be killed, injured, or maimed. And while America allowed the migrations of other countries' criminals, blacks sat beneath the tree and on cotton fields and watched. The pictures seen were learned and imitated and instilled flash, fame, and flamboyancy, and also fluky. Fluky Stokes to be exact. The baddest motherfucker south of Mississippi. Understand fluky was really a country nigga at heart, raised with principles, values, and integrity of a man. Not a for the time being man, but a man who believed in work, getting it, taking care of your family, and holding your own. That value system seldom seen today. Take, for example, rapturous names like Lucas, Barnes. But nevertheless, honorable. So honorable, in fact, he raised boys who stood amongst men who would fall victim to the pressures of that time. Heroin and cocaine would break the strongest of men, even though they were gangs to influence unity and neighborhood pride of that time. Organizations like Gangsta Disciples, the Black Peacestone Rangers, the Vice Lords, all black, all strong, but all without fluky. I don't even know what drugs look like. I never used them or deal. I don't even drink. It takes a hell of a man to look you in the face and say he ain't do it, or does it. Depends on who you ask that question and where you're asking it at. Just try one of America's jails and every prisoner would say not guilty. For various reasons, they'd likely say a lot. But then they ain't the only ones to say anything. Since the days of Fluky, there would always be two sides. What we would say and what they would say. But which side would you believe? Willie Fluky Stokes was a chameleon of sorts. To many, he was like a Robin Hood giving to the poor. To the police, he was nothing more than a drug dealing gangster who would stop at nothing, even murder, to protect his empire. Fluky Stokes' violent death was consistent with a life full of corruption, dope dealing, and murder. Fluky wanted people to believe his diamonds, cars, and cash came from Lady Luck. I'm a gambler. Ash, you poo, dice. Maybe in the beginning, but nine years ago, he traded in his dice and cards for cocaine and heroin. And Willie Fluky Stokes built a drug empire that left nothing to chance. Unit 5 has learned that Fluky's drug empire was making more money than anyone ever imagined. Authorities now believe his empire was grossing a million dollars a week. That's more than $50 million a year. Confidential federal drug enforcement documents obtained by Unit 5 reveal how big Fluky's organization was. Fluky was trying to hire hitman James Allen as an enforcer to protect his drug organization. At that time, according to DEA documents, Fluky showed him 22 kilos of heroin worth more than $60 million. That was at just one stash house. Fluky had an endless supply of cocaine and heroin, and he established a drug messenger service consisting of 30 to 50 runners who could deliver his drugs anywhere in the city 24 hours a day. 
His runners were equipped with beepers like this one on Gordon Battle's attache case. Unit 5 has learned that Fluky gave his runners only two ounces of dope at any time. Fluky limited the amount of dope he had on the street for a number of reasons. First, he could limit his losses if any of his runners got caught by the police, and he could keep better track of his dope supply if he gave everyone the same amount. And finally, he wouldn't give anyone any more dope until they paid for the dope they already sold. Fluky never handled the dope. He handled the money. And this man, Earl Wilson, started giving drug investigators an idea of just how much money Fluky was making and how much dope he was pushing on the streets. Wilson became an undercover operative for the police, and he documented six weeks of Fluky's activities. Here at 121 East 47th Street, Fluky set up office and counted his dope money, which was brought to him in gym bags, briefcases, and paper sacks. For example, Unit 5 has learned that on October 23rd, he counted as much as $200,000. On October 28th, he counted $60,000 from just one money runner, and on November 1st, three runners gave Fluky money. One of the bags contained $40,000. This man, Big Bill Hill, was Fluky's right-hand man. Pictured here in better days, his fingers were covered with diamonds and his hands stuffed with cash. On October 5, 1983, he was caught with 134 packets of cocaine and heroin. Until he was put out of business, prosecutors say he alone made $100,000 a week for Fluky's organization. And the money just rolled into Big Bill from the street people who in turn rolled it into Fluky's pockets. Eight ball side pocket. It's one of the hardest shots a pool player can take, but it was real easy for one to try and paint. The picture being painted on Fluky was one that was anything but poetic. One that defied their own description of Robin Hood. Understand Fluky was anything but legal, but why? What would make such a principled man lead, as they say, an unscrupulous life? Whatever it was Fluky did, he did well. One thing for sure is he left a legacy of flash and celebrity type behavior for family and offsprings as well as for those left to recite his legendary stories. My name is Chip. I'm Chip's son, Chip Jr. We're just doing the blueprint about everything my family was doing. You know what I'm saying? My father, my uncle, my cousins. Man, my daddy was my best friend. Like, I learned so much from him just like without him telling me nothing. You know what I'm saying? So like, from what I knew from him, like I ain't never seen him scared before. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't really too much people in life I ain't never seen like that. Like, somebody probably want to hear like about some money and nothing. Nah, it was just like, just how it was. Like, people don't know like my daddy was real silly. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was real silly, you know, real, but he was only like that with people we knew, like around his kids and like around his family. Everybody else in the street would be like, oh, fuck him, you know what I'm saying? Something like that. Or, you know what I'm saying? He a beast, you know what I'm saying? Some, something like that. But from what I knew from him, you know, he just taught me and my brothers how to be men, you know what I'm saying? And, like, that's all I really can say about it. As with any hustler, life would be give and take. You would live and learn. But at home, a man would teach. And outside the home, things would be different. The man at home would be different than the man in the streets. And according to law enforcement, Gordon Battle, also known as Chip, was one of the five members of Fluky's organization. Sources say he, as did the other members, controlled the low end of the south side of Chicago as well as other areas. Chip allegedly had free reign during the time when gangs controlled all. Always dressed to a T, Chip and all the members would always carry signature briefcases rumored to be filled with cash. And unbelievable as that was, it was more incredible how this hustler remained untouched. See, hustlers don't have territory, man. Hustlers get money, man. See, Chicago is real territorial. It's real gangbang oriented and, you know, certain niggas was getting money with certain niggas because they only could get money with certain niggas because of whatever organization they was from. But what made them so slick, they didn't claim to be a part of no organization, even though they did have gang ties. So that enabled them to get money with whoever, you know what I'm saying? Like wherever, with whoever, from the richest white motherfuckers to the grimiest street motherfuckers. Didn't matter what side of town. So all that ter territorial shit really wasn't no territory. Niggas just had spots where they got money at, you know what I'm saying? It was just, that was basically it. With Chicago being one of the most segregated cities in the country, Having your own spot meant you had special characteristics. 
qualities known not to squares, but to those who could move around. There was Big Bill, Fluky's advisor and elder who could move a pair of dice as nice as the sway of a pretty woman's ass. And then there was Chip, father to Chachi and Chip Jr., the mover who would shake shit up, serious about his business, checking chumps, keeping them in line. Then there was Grass, Chip's sibling, who some say had a rivalry simply because of the closeness and age. And last but not least, Willie, as in Willie the Wimp. Small as Popeye, but strong as the center shit from a diarrhea-ridden dog. Together there would be an alliance none could break, and they would be bearers of their special bond. They would hail Fluky as king, and as king, there would be competition from none. Fluky would try to eliminate his competition any way he had to. On the street, it might mean murder. In the police department, it meant bribes. On May 26, 1984, at a barber shop on the south side, Leroy Dixon was gunned down, shot in the head. He tried to move in on Fluky's drug turf. Last January, on Merrill Street, Lavert Handy made the same mistake. He wanted to sell dope in Fluky's area. He ended up with a shotgun blast in the back of his head. On July 30th, in this parking lot, Anthony Brown was killed. He made the fatal mistake of robbing one of Fluky's runners and then refusing to return the money. For that, he was shot through the heart. Police say the man behind these murders was Willie Fluky Stokes. He was trying to protect his multi-million dollar drug empire, so he simply had his competition eliminated, according to police. James Delaney is commander of Area 1. We think he'd uh, do anything to protect his empire. We think that he made his money dealing in drugs. Uh, we think he protected his interests uh, any way he had to, and if it led to murder, so be it. Fluky's criminal record spans a quarter century, arrested more than 60 times. Charges range from drug violations to murder. But since 1978, Fluky's life in crime seemed to come to a halt, even though his drug business was more profitable than ever. Unit 5 has learned while some police officers were working hard trying to put Fluky behind bars, others were on his payroll, secretly feeding him police reports and other inside information. It was after the funeral of Fluky's son, Willie the Wimp, that police got the surprising news. Fluky's informers penetrated the police department's detective division at Area 1. Stokes had been stopped by Las Vegas police while on a gambling junket at Caesars Palace. He was caught with Chicago mm -hmm. police mugshots of the suspects in his son's murder. Police tell Unit 5 it was not uncommon for Fluky to have stacks of confidential police reports. On raids or uh, when search warrants were executed in the past, uh, it would not be unusual to find police reports uh, in Fluky's possession. Did that surprise you as a prosecutor? Well, Fluky would have no real good reason to have police reports. Uh, unless he's trying to take care of his people. Drug investigators from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office through an undercover informant learned that Fluky had a lot of friends on the police department. Fluky would often spot police officers on the street and tell his bodyguards not to worry because, quote, they're my friends. Fluky suggested that if the police department had special details working late at night, he knew when they were out, where they were working, and who they were. Knowing that kind of information enabled Fluky to stay away from the police and to keep his empire operating without interference. He attempted to pay off police officers for police reports, and we believe other things. We believe he was making an attempt to own the entire Chicago Police Department. Fluky, according to authorities in newspaper reports, was out of control. Out of order, some might say, but in his world, being out of order meant being in control. And what better thing to do than control the police? What better bullet to bust than that of a cop? That mentality was common, but the actual act was rare, as was Fluky. And although rare indeed, Fluky wouldn't be rare enough to escape the turmoil mounting. Authorities was on his back, he had open cases, and enforcing his area meant rivals had to die. A lot of shit came with the game for Fluky, but not even he was prepared for what was about to come. What was about to come would be something not to be outdone till this day in Chicago, or anywhere else for that matter. Fluky's son Willie would be killed, and with death, the world would be his stage. What I know happened was he was on 7th night at the hotel. Little Willie always stayed at hotels. He ain't had to, but he did. Little Willie probably was about the littlest nigga you could ever imagine, you know what I'm saying? He probably was about 5, 3, 100, and a buck. Buck 20, buck 25, wet, but he always kept a pistol on him. So he's supposed to be 
supposedly he had a broad up in the hotel. Some niggas ran up on him um, at night up at the hotel on 7th night for shot him. And you know, he got, uh, he was on life support for about a week and they decided to take him off. He was buried in the Cadillac, had a, like, I guess about like 10 racks in his hands, you know what I'm saying? He had his jury on and, you know, Fluke was just like, that's how my son, like, his son was his best friend, you know what I'm saying? Like, you were his shit in the street, like he had his son killed and all this type of shit. Nah, like, and his son was his best friend, you know what I'm saying? Like, his son, the one who got that thing cracking, you know what I'm saying? So, like, he wanted he wanted his son buried how he was living. So, you know what I'm saying? So, the, the, the folklore and all that, that just come go along with it. It was just him wanting his son buried how he was living. Drove a Cadillac every day, you know what I'm saying? $10,000 in his pocket wasn't nothing, you know what I'm saying? The little jury, that, that's how they was living back then. Get it how you live. A live nigga street term used today, but back then, it was incredible. A Cadillac coffin was unheard of and sent shockwaves in the underworld and in mainstream. And when life or death made that much noise, you could almost bet there would be more. Fluky had managed to get through some tough times. From a small time gambler to a major figure was a street accomplishment that would compare to a corporate CEO. But with the death of his son, he started to change. Life for Fluky wasn't the same. Yeah, he was still associated with celebrities and athletes, but his soul was empty. And that emptiness led him to slipping. His vision was cloudy, and in the streets, a nigga needed to see. And see Fluky, someone did with automatic weapons that would kill him and his driver. Fluky had got caught with his pants down. killed Willie Fluky Stokes is still a mystery tonight, but in our portrait of a pusher, a picture is emerging about who wants to fill his shoes. Grass and my daddy was best friends. So, like, as time was progressing, you could start seeing them branch off, you know what I'm saying? And, like, they, I hear stories, like, from my mama, because she always, like, used to be a talker. And she would be, like, just telling us or talking to our friends, telling us what was going on, like, they was just getting into it. I don't know if it was money or, you know what I'm saying? A lot of things happened. A lot of words was exchanged. You know, family members was involved. And uh, make a long story short, on 50, on uh, 50, what's that? 51st in uh, Lake Park at the Pancake House. He caught my daddy slipping my, my, and uh, shot him. My father uh, died getting rushed to the hospital. You know I'm saying slowly but surely, you just saw him branching off. He was hearing stories like, your daddy and grass got into it, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I can remember one time my daddy came home, his hand was fucked up. They had robbed him behind a Woolworth uh, down here in Hyde Park. They had had him back there. At first, you know, my mother taught me and my brother and sister to forgive because he was so familiar to the family and we didn't understand a lot of the details before. But, nah, he ain't raised me. He ain't, he ain't support anything that we was doing. He just was around and we seen him after my father got killed. But and like, but you know, my daddy, he always loved grass, like even to the day he died, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I still love him, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how you know, like, we all are separate entities. Cause my brother, he like had business. I don't have no business, you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't mad, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I knew how crazy my daddy was. I love him to death, you know what I'm saying? But like, me being mad at grass ain't finna bring my daddy back, you know what I'm saying? And can't nobody tell me about these streets like all, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, I gotta look in the in his eyes every day. And I see life kicking his ass every day, you know what I'm saying? What doesn't kill you can only make you stronger. And Chip would never get a chance to be strong again. The strength that Fluky gave him, gone. The strength that he showed his sons, that too, was gone. What was left was a legacy less the very men that built it. Jealousy played a part, as did fear. Greed also showed its face only to be mirrored in the face of others. As you see, 
Only the names change, but as strange as it seems, the same times remain. Unit 5 has learned exclusively that police are concerned about a possible drug war because three different big-time dealers would like to take over where Flukey left off. When Willie Flukey Stokes was buried, the head of the largest single independent drug operation in Chicago history was laid to rest. But the body of his drug empire is still alive and thriving and in turmoil. There appears to be three groups muscling for control of Flukey's $50 million a year drug network. One group is headed by Gordon Battle, Flukey's former partner. Another by Chuck McFerrin, Flukey's arch enemy. And the third by Sam Love Jr., Flukey's former associate. The struggle for control of Flukey's well-entrenched drug turf started, and members of Flukey's organization were brutally gunned down. Narcotics investigator Tom Shinnick. And they're vicious and violent enough that they would um, protect themselves at all costs. Unit 5 has learned that shortly before Flukey was murdered, a new cartel of independent drug dealers was formed and he began to fear a major drug war was imminent. On November 10th at this restaurant, Flukey met with this man, Chuck McFerrin. Police theorize that McFerrin is the self-appointed leader of the new cartel. Also at that meeting, Pedro Rodriguez, a man police consider to be a major supplier of cocaine and heroin to Chicago drug dealers. Rodriguez, believed to have organized crime connections in New York, Detroit, and South Florida, may have made a pact to deal only with the new cartel. The cartel is expected to take any action to gain control of Flukey's lucrative drug empire. And the big question is, how much is Gordon Battle willing to give up? Battle, known as Chip on the street, is Flukey's heir apparent. Battle lives in a fortress-like house on the far south side of the city. He was Flukey's partner for the last few years. Another group police believe could emerge as a major source of drugs is the Love family. Police discovered evidence of the Love's big-time drug business on January 19th, when narcotics agents raided this Alsop apartment house and confiscated more than a half million dollars in drug money. The cash, in mostly tens and twenties, belongs to Sam Love Jr. The street has been relatively quiet since Flukey was murdered, but police say trouble could erupt at any time, because in the drug business, takeovers are generally not friendly. Despite extensive criminal histories, none of these men have been convicted of serious drug offenses. Unit 5 has learned that federal drug agents have been investigating the fluky drug network for three years. And we have also learned that IRS was on the verge of indicting the flamboyant drug dealer for tax evasion at about the time he was killed. I don't think, Carol and Ron, that this is the last we're going to hear of the fluky drug network. Fluky, the reason that they changed half of these laws and what's going on right now, you know what I'm saying? That's the motherfucker who they start taking your tax, your money, your drug money, and leave as soon as they arrest you. Because he was buying it right back out. You know what I'm saying? They didn't understand it. It's the greatest, man. So you got to give it to him. Give it to him, man. Because that's the truth. And you heard it. It's real. They laid the game down. They told you what's happening. So accept this. Starting the day. He was the boss. All that stuff, that, all that paid and cool shit, like all that shit. That was good shit. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, <coughs> Got killed, plenty of money was made, you know what I'm saying? And it's, a, it's a big story. All that, you know, New York shit and all that shit. It's cool for the TV, but it was real down here in Chicago, you know what I'm saying? Legendary Flukey Stokes House, man. My uncle, um, you know what I'm saying? A lot of my cousins and shit, they was raised here. Uh, top one right here, this used to be Sabrina and Luttrell room. You know what I'm saying? Flukey Gene room used to be in the back. It's not a big place, but you know what I'm saying, back then, a, a condo like this down here on the low end, man, where all the motherfucking excitement and shit was that this was the place to be. Like, man, we had all this shit, all these mates, we could do no wrong with it. This is where the money and the flow was at, you know, Flute so kept a lot of money in there. And believe it or not, Lil Willie used to stay right next door, you know what I'm saying, in this place right here. It used to be green right here, but, you know what I'm saying, they did a little something to it. Uh, you know, this is just, you know, where we came up at, man, all of us. That's just real life, real talk. You come around here, all these niggas hustlers, you know what I'm saying? Like, you come up and down the strip, you can say whatever you want to about these niggas over here. But all us some hustlers, that's real, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't give a fuck what they do, how they do it, they get them some money. Getting money was, is, and always will be in Black Lopedia. The story within the story that says it ain't where you from, it's where you at. And obviously these men, these stories, are all at the same place at one point in their lives. The question is sometimes different, but the answers are always the same. To get it. It's as simple and as corny as that shit they teach in school. 
to be or not to be. 